with your kids. Hola, ni hao, konnichiwa, assalamu alaikum, shalom, mahaba, moni moni wanji, namaste, jambo, bienvenidos. Hi, my name is Jed Lee and this is the Reading With Your Kids podcast. We are coming to you from the beautiful neighborhood of Reedville in the southwest corner of Boston, Massachusetts. We are so delighted and so honored that you are joining us in our mission to help families grow closer through reading. Please be sure to subscribe to the show on the iHeartRadio app, on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, Spotify, wherever you find your podcast. Our guest today is Annika and we, Denise. She is here to celebrate her beautiful picture book. It's called A Girl Named Rosita. Before we invite our guests into the studio, we want to let you know that this episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast is brought to you by Jerry the Squirrel, the great series by our friend Sean P.B. Robinson. Jerry the Squirrel loves inventing, and he's pretty good at it. What he's not good at, however, is making sure his inventions only do what he wants them to do. You and your kids are going to howl with laughter as they read that Jerry's nut harvester turns into a nut cannon. And his earplug, they turn into megaphones. And his automatic slippers, well, they turn on every squirrel in the village. Sean's Jerry the Squirrel series would be a great addition to any family library. We also want to encourage you to visit Sean's website. It's seanpdrobinson.com. Go there to discover more about Jerry the Squirrel and all of the fantastic books coming from the mind of Sean P.B. Robinson. I'm really excited. Our guest today is here because my beautiful wife discovered her book doing a search uh, on one of her heroes, Rita Moreno. Please welcome to the show the author of A Girl Named Rosita, Anika Aldemui. Denise, hey, Annika, how are you? I'm great. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to have you on. As I said, you know, my beautiful wife suggested that I have you on, and I always listen to my beautiful wife. That is um, how I stay happy. Smart, smart man. Yeah. <laughs> so tell us about a girl named Rosita. Well, um, A Girl Named Rosita is uh, my second picture book biography, and I'm really uh, excited about writing about strong Puerto Rican women (laughs) in various uh, careers. My first book, Planting Stories, is about the first uh, Puerto Rican librarian to work at the New York Public Library, and I had such an extraordinary time writing that book and researching and asking family who grew up listening to Gura Bel Pre's storytelling. Um, it really made me sort of go back into my own history. And so uh, I was hooked <laughs> and wanted to write about um, another Puerto Ricana. And of course, I also, I grew up um, knowing Rita Moreno and loving her in West Side Story and kids television like the electric company and the muppet show um but i really you know i i knew her as a kid and had as an author had to go back and really research about her journey and again um was able to talk to relatives and find out what it was like you know seeing her in west side story and winning an oscar being the first latina to win an oscar you know there was so much richness there in in that story so it was a joy to to learn more about her and write about her in a children's book. Yeah. So let's t- talk a little bit more about Rita. She certainly has had a huge impact on uh, our American culture and certainly has been a great role model for you and, and for my beautiful wife. But also, I think, for the... Um, for the culture, the, the greater culture. Yeah, I, th- I think that she's had an impact um, on uh, everybody here in the States. Absolutely. You know, her career is, um, it's a seven decades long and still going career. Um, she is, she really embodies, you know, if there is such a thing as the American dream, you know, Rita really embodies it. She, she came here, uh, there was a language barrier. She, 
didn't know anyone. She left family behind. Um, but she had this extraordinary talent that carried her forward and the support of her mommy, her, her mother, um, who kind of saw that in her. And she worked really hard to get parts that were, I mean, some of the parts that she, she accepted were pretty stereotypical, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, and history's lens is not kind to these, these parts, you know, she had to really pay her dues and work her way up. But, um, but she became America's sweetheart <laughs> in many, many ways mm-hmm. and, and successful across, you know, many different, um, she was in film and television and the stage. And I think she just kind of like snap kick twirled her way into our hearts as a collective. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now, when you were growing up um, and, and, and seeing her, was there, uh, was there an instant connection because it's like, wow, she looks like me up there on that screen or was it something else? You know, it was interesting. My dad, of course, loved, loved her. Um, and he would tell me, you know, she's Puerto Rican. And I think that that is because there were so few, you know, uh, role models in, in television and film at the time. So when there is someone there that you identify with and you share a cultural background with, you know, everyone's like instantly, oh, she's one of ours. <laughs> you know? So they, they made sure to point that out. And then, of course, you follow everything that they do and cheer for them along the way. And it's almost like you're cheering for someone in your own family. That's what it felt like. Mm-hmm. So we followed Rita's career. Um, I was a big theater kid as well. I was interested in theater. Um, I did it all through school and the summer theater program. So you know, her theatrical work and me being able to relate to her as a Latina meant a lot. You know, I had someone to, to see myself in. So, so it was a number of things, you know, it's funny because in, in a lot of ways, like my family is, you know, Puerto Ricans come in all shades. (laughs) My family is more, is darker, you know, so, and she's, she's fairly light, (laughs) light skinned, Puerto Rican. And um, although she says when she first came to school, that she didn't feel that way. She felt different and she was teased for that and she didn't speak the language. So she was teased and she said that she used to try to wash her face and scrub it off. Like that she, she was trying to fit into all these fair skinned um, classmates, you know, it's so interesting. It's all relative, but Mm -hmm. I looked at her and I wasn't, I didn't immediately recognize that she was, but then she, she did a few, she was in West side story, right? So there, okay. Which, of course, she, they put makeup on her in West Side Story. They put makeup on all the actors to make them this one shade of brown. It's like one of the film's uh, criticisms is they didn't get that many Puerto Rican actors, and, and they kind of made them um, all one shade, which, mm-hmm. as we know, we are not. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, um, But then I remember seeing her in that skit. It's a, I think she's, this is one of the um, skits that she won the an Emmy for, and it was with... It was on the Muppet Show, and she was with Animal. I don't know if you've ever seen this skit. I, I don't know if I have. Tell us about it. it. <laughs> she sings Fever, the song. Ah. They give me fever. Mm-hmm. And she's wearing, a, you know, she's beautiful, and she's wearing, like, this sort of, this, this, this very lovely outfit, and Animal's playing the drums behind her. And it keeps, like, breaking into this fantastically loud drum solo, and she's getting more and more annoyed with him. And it's like comic genius you know the interplay between (laughs) animal and rita and then she starts kind of like telling him off in spanish and that was like the moment that it really clicked for me (laughs) oh okay (laughs) she's she's puerto riqueña she speaks spanish and she was just so cool and so beautiful that i I think that was as a as a kid when i i really got it and then i was you know like so excited to to find someone that i could look up to and, and feel a connection with. Yeah. You know, one of the th- reasons I'm, I'm excited to have you on here is that it gives us another chance just to talk about the unique relationship Puerto Rico has with the United States. Not everybody is aware of the fact that every person born in Puerto Rico is a United States citizen. It is a part of, it is a commonwealth, but it is a part of the United States. It could very well become a state in the not-too-distant future, although 
we've been talking about that since I got married, which was over 30 years ago. Yeah, that's a complicated issue. It, it, but, well, it yeah. is. It is. It is. And, yeah. and the people I know, uh, the people in Puerto Rico are kind of torn. They have voted on, on you know, whether or not to become a state or to p- become independent. And most of those votes um, come out with, the, with people saying, yeah, we kind of like it the way it is. Let's, we, we, you know, let's kind of keep it here. Yeah, it's it's interesting. Um, and I think there's there's always like a difference between Puerto Ricans that live on the island and those mm-hmm. that are um, in the diaspora and, you know, stateside. But <laughs> what's amazing to me, and I think it really came out after Hurricane Maria, was that so few people here really, you, you're correct in saying that there's this not there's a misunderstanding about the relationship between the U.S. and Puerto Rico, and I was surprised how many people didn't know <laughs> that Puerto Ricans are citizens. I mean, that's just basic stuff that they should have learned in school, right? Um, and yeah, the statehood question is very complicated. Um, we have a, a colonial history with Puerto Rico that's complicated mm-hmm. as well. Um, but there's, it's, it's such an interesting relationship too, because here you have, um, Puerto Ricans really, they, they like the freedom of coming back and forth and they see, a lot of them do really see themselves as a part of the U S and they are, they can't vote in the <laughs> presidential elections. Um, they have limited representation, but there's this, this really interesting dynamic of, of, of shared culture, while at the same time, Puerto Ricans are fiercely um, proud of their their own nationalism, mm-hmm. you know, their own Puerto Rican identity. So it's a fi- it's an interesting um, relationship. Yeah, it it really is. My my father in law used to joke, um, you know, because in in he he would say this, and and I, I think you've you probably heard it through through your family and friends. Almost every Puerto Rican says, someday I'm moving back to the island. It's, it's my home. <laughs> I love it. And he used to say to me, Jed, if every Puerto Rican who says they're going to move back to Puerto Rico actually moves, they're going to have to put it on a second story. <laughs> yeah. That's probably true. <laughs> because there are probably more Puerto Ricans living here in the States right now. There's It's a huge population in the island. I think there are more uh, people living in Puerto Rico than there are living in your island island of road absolutely and you know more in in the state of delaware so it's a very significant population but you know the number of puerto ricans here in the states is at least equal if not greater than the number back on the island yeah and you know a lot of and there's this this um that back and forth quality Mm -hmm. is that's that's the because you know it is there is an ease of traveling back and forth that there are many people that come and they're here for a little while and go back and then they come back again. You know, I don't know that we have that relationship with any other um, place. Mm -hmm. And for instance, like my dad grew up spending summers in Puerto Rico. He would be there every summer living with his grandfather at his grandfather's house. And um, so he felt a part of the island and also a part of here. He almost had, and it does breed this nostalgia for <laughs> for for his childhood, for that time. Whenever he would speak about it, it was like it was the most enchanted place. And he had so many memories. And as a child, I was envious of that, being able to live, you know, with a foot in both in both places. Yeah. Now, getting back to planting stories, uh, mm. Pura, she had she brought that love of Puerto Rico and Puerto Rican culture and really kind of celebrated that within the New York public public library system. Absolutely. Talk about a great example of like taking her culture and and literally that's why I use the metaphor of planting is because um, one of the things she used to say is that she wanted to be, you know, she knew the story of Johnny Appleseed. That's folklore that she knew. And she wanted to be like Johnny Appleseed, but with stories to plant these, um, folk tales and Latino stories in the hearts and minds of the kids that would come into the library so that they would grow and that they would um, get more books in the library and more access to their own folklore, which really didn't happen until, until Puro Belpre worked at the library. That, you know, it, it, there was no 
Puerto Rican folktales on the shelves in the branch that she worked. Um, she called around to other branches to find out if they had these books. They didn't have them. Mm-hmm. And so she was such a brilliant storyteller. She was able, and that's, that's, you know, the oral tradition, obviously. I feel like everyone in Puerto Rico is a storyteller. <laughs> you know, that's like, that's an art that Puerto Ricans have. Um, but then there are these, these well-known folk tales that were not, were not written down. You know, they were, they were passed down. So she heard them from her grandmother and they were her favorites. And she came here and said, well, they're not in books yet, but I can, I can tell the story to mm-hmm. children in the library and the librarians that hired her said she could, but they also encouraged her to write the stories down in life. She was taking classes in library school and said, you know, we're really, if we do a story at story time in the library, we really are supposed to have the book for the kids to take out. We're going to make an exception, but also you have to promise that you're going to start writing these stories down. And she did, and she got them published. Um, so she wound up being not only this influential um, person in the library that was amazing at organizing and getting families in and doing library card drives and having cultural holiday celebrations. But she also became the first person to publish a main, in a mainstream press, a Latino storybook. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, I also love the fact that we can take a moment and use our, our, our discussion about planting stories to remind everybody of the importance of our public library systems as Somebody who's been performing in schools and in libraries around, uh, across the country for over 30 years, one of the things that is very, very clear to me, uh, especially when I'm in a city library, is that not only is it a great resource for the community, but it's an especially important resource for people who are new to our country. If you go here, for example, in in the Boston Public Library, as I tour the branches of the Boston Public Library, when I'm in East Boston, you know, I, I look out and I see it, uh, you know, a, an audience filled with kids from Central America and Brazil. Uh, when I'm in the Brighton section of Boston, I see uh, recent immigrants from Russia and Eastern Europe. And th- these are these are places where folks can go and get the information they need. It's like a, like a living Google. A li- librarians are like living Google machines, and you, yeah. know, you can just go there and be pointed in the right direction and uh, not be worried that you're going to click on a link that's going to ruin your computer. <laughs> so true. Uh, you know, yes, we do have Google, and we can have information at our fingertips, but libraries and librarians provide this, you know, for, for reading selection, certainly a curated um, selection for you that they know you and they know your family and they know what you like and they can put books in kids' hands that that inspire them to read more or that nudge uh, reluctant readers. You know, th- there will never be a time when librarians aren't vital mm-hmm. <laughs> and libraries and public libraries aren't vital. Uh, and I think the role of libraries is really changing. You know, you mentioned you know, for new arrivals from other countries that libraries are important. I know certainly, and we just mentioned uh, Hurricane Maria again, Mm -hmm. but I was at a library conference. I was speaking to a group of librarians and a a librarian from New York um, and one from Boston, and they they got up and talked about how uh, a lot of people were displaced and came here from Puerto Rico, and they were coming into the library to get internet access, to try and, libraries were on the front lines of helping people, you know, so the the public library is so important for so many people in so many ways, and I I love that Planting Story shines a light on that as well, yeah. because, I mean, I, the, the person who introduced me to Pura Bel Prez, uh, stories is my Titi Rosie, and she took me to the library. I'll never forget this. And she said to me, "You have to get your own library card." Until then, I was taking out books on her library card. Mm-hmm. You know, she and I was shy about it for whatever. I was like five years old, <laughs> and she said, "No, it's important for you to have this card in your own name that you can always use, and it will always be like a passport mm-hmm. to." stories and your imagination. You can always have this, you know, if you can't go into the store and buy a book, which is the case sometimes, yeah. you know, you have this wonderful resource. So she, she taught me that very, very early. 
And I think largely it was the influence of Puro del Rey on her growing up. Yeah. And and think about that. When you're four, five, six years old, how proud are you when you get that first piece of identification that you can carry? It's like, hey, I'm a person. I have this card and I get to take out books. They trust me with books. It was amazing. It felt exactly like that. It felt amazing. I couldn't, I felt so important. Mm-hmm. You know, it had my name on it mm-hmm. and I could take out my own books. And it, it, it was, it was like this. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't believe I was this little and I was allowed to do this. And, and even on, you know, I have a grandmother, other side of my family, who was a volunteer at the local library. So I would go with her when she would be, you know, helping to shelve and circulate books. It was a tiny library. And so they relied mainly on volunteers. And I remember just sitting there with her all day and being able to read in this window seat where the sun would come in. And there were little few toys and pillows and I could just, I can just lose hours in that library. So I have a very special and um, wonderful memories and a great relationship with the idea of public libraries. And I try to support ours whenever I can. Yeah. You know, as you were talking and reminding us that not too long ago, libraries, even in places like New York City and Boston, didn't have uh, books available in other languages. And I think Mm. a lot of people were afraid, oh, well, if people, people come here they have to drop their language and start learning english because otherwise we're you'll, you'll never learn english and we're not going to, be able to communicate with each other well, the reality is that maybe if somebody immigrates here when they're 40 50 maybe they won't learn the language it's difficult i'd have a hard time learning mandarin if i moved to china now but if i moved to china and had kids my kids would be speaking whatever language they'd be growing up in in a very, very short period. And every wave of immigration that has proven here in the United States that the first generation may struggle, but the second generation, and certainly by the third generation, the families are, are speaking English and they're celebrating their own culture and they're assimilated into the greater culture. So I just think that having access to different languages is such a benefit and such a joy and I think we should be really encouraging our kids even if they're not going to learn every language to have just books available let them see books in Spanish and French and Creole and Mandarin whatever language and just understand that this reading books are a gift to the world yeah languages are you know I I feel like multilingualism, bilingualism is like a superpower, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) And and there was a time where new arrivals would come and their parents were afraid. My parents were among them, afraid if if they're not speaking English to me that I wasn't going to learn, I wasn't going to do well in school. Um, That has been totally debunked, right? Mm -hmm. We know that learning languages and reading books in other languages is it makes your brains work better. (laughs) It makes kids smarter. It makes them global citizens. It makes, it builds empathy because the language is a bridge to the rest of culture, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're reading a story with words, Mandarin words or Japanese words or Spanish words, and it it causes kids to ask questions, well, what is that? And it becomes like just normal, you Mm -hmm. know, just, just, okay. So we, this is this country. That's what we represent. We are, we are um, an amalgam of cultures. So, I think putting that, putting books in other language in front of kids, I love books that sprinkle it in. That's what I try to do in my texts and some of my favorites, you know, weave it naturally into the text because that's how my family spoke, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) They would drop in and out. Um, It's wonderful. Yeah, I, I, I learn a lot by reading books with other languages in it. And I think kids are getting more um, accustomed to that. Mm -hmm. You know, some people worry, oh, well, what if they don't understand something? It's like, well, that's the great thing about having Google. Uh (laughs) You can Google it, you know, or ask. And even in the encouragement to ask, you're encouraging kids to be curious about uh, cultures outside of their own. Well, I'm curious if there is another strong Latina that you're planning on writing about. Yes, totally um, different. I have um, education, library field, I have entertainment, and my next book is about someone in politics. 
Ooh. <laughs> um, okay. It is Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio Cortez, ah. uh, the youngest uh, woman ever to be elected to Congress, right? So um, I, I, she's from. I'm from Queens. My family's from Queens in the Bronx. You know, she's from the Bronx. She's now representing Queens. She's younger than me, but <laughs> I feel a lot in common with her. Um, the story of her father and how important he was to her. Just, I really really was impressed by her poise and what she's been able to do, regardless of what you think of her politics. You know, this mm -hmm. book is just really about um, her being someone who is really speaking and representing young people's voices, right? And, mm -hmm. and the power of that. Um, so so I was thrilled to be able to, to write um, AOC. It's called Phenomenal AOC, and it comes out uh, fall of 2023. Awesome. No, 2020, no, 2022. Sorry. <laughs> I have another book coming out in 2023, and that's fiction. Um, it is also a bilingual book, but it's not a biography. Okay. Well, so. we're really excited. We'd love to have you back to celebrate the, the release of that book. And I, I, I like, and I think it's really important, no matter what, whether or not you agree with somebody's politics, you should be able to look at the person and and acknowledge their accomplishments. Uh, I know gr growing up as a Boston Red Sox fan, it was really hard for me to acknowledge that anybody who played for the Yankees had any <laughs> skill at all. But now as I look back and go, yeah, no, they, they were good players. I didn't want them to win, and I couldn't ever root for them, but they were really talented. And I think the same is true in politics and other aspects of our lives and I think if we remember that and are able to see people who have differences politically than us and see that person as a human being maybe we won't be so polarized I agree yeah. that's absolutely true I agree with that yeah and you know I thought about that when they asked me to write about AOC how do I present her story in a way that isn't about politics because, you know, that's what she's all about. But mm -hmm. um, if you see the person, you see what kind of student she was, what, what it was like for her in school, what it was like for her moving from the Bronx to a school in Westchester, and uh, what happened when her, her father passed away when she was just in college. You know, it really does make you see the person behind it. And um, I I happen to align with, with much mm -hmm. of her politics, but but I think even if I didn't, I would I'd want to know a more about her story because I think it's inspiring to young people to see uh, her activism. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're really excited. I know people are going to want to know where they can go to find out more about a girl named Rosita and planting stories. Uh, they can go to my website, which has both of those books, which also both books have um, curriculum guides and additional activities that you can read the book with your kids or your classroom. Um, so go there to find that extra fun extras. Um, and basically, if you want to purchase the book, you can go. I hope that you'll go to your independent bookstore mm -hmm. because I always like to support them. But it's also available. They're available online as well. Yeah. And tell people your website address, please. Oh, it is um, www.anikadenise.com. Awesome. We've had a great time speaking to the author of A Girl Named Rosita, Anika Adamui Denise. Hey, Anika, thank you so much for being with us. Thanks, Chad. It was a ball. Thanks. Please be sure to join us for the next episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. Our guest will be Athens Pellegrino. She'll be here to celebrate Mission, my first PCS. Want to thank the folks who made today's show so wonderful. Of course, want to thank our guest, Annika Aldemui Denise. Also, want to thank our sponsor, Sean P. B. Robinson. Please be sure to check out Jerry the Squirrel. Want to thank my team, Alejandro Doherty, Fatima Khan, Rory Grady, Michael Murphy. Want to thank my beautiful wife for all the support she gives me. Most of all, we all want to join together to thank you. Thank you so very much for taking the time to join us today. And as always, thank you so very much for taking the time to make the world a better place by reading with your kids. I'll be looking for you in the next edition of the Reading with Your Kids podcast. <laughs>